Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cage Talk. Today's special guest we have is WEC lightweight champion. We have UFC veteran. We have Jamie Varner. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well, Alex. Uh, thank you for having me on. Hey, no problem, man. And a lot of people, uh, when they talk to me, they're like, do I have to say Mr. Titan? I'm like, absolutely not. You can just say my name. It's fine. <laughs> they're like, I don't think I want to say that. Like, I understand completely, but... Uh, What's up, man? How's everything? How's uh, how's life? How's everything, brother? Yeah, man. Um, well, life right now is is crazy for me, like everybody else. Um, it's completely upside down. Um, you know, no gym, no normal routine. Like, what is normal anymore? Um, no, no more shaking hands or giving hugs. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, things are a little bit different. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, been doing some fist bumps here and there too, but. Uh, yeah, things are good. Um, and if you're talking about, you know, since fighting, um, you know, post fight career, you know, it was, it was kind of a roller coaster ride. Like my, kind of like my, my fight career was like a roller coaster ride of ups and downs. Um, I owned a gym. My last year of fighting in the UFC, I decided to open a gym okay. and trying to juggle running a business and a professional fighting. and trying to be a yeah. professional athlete it was, it was impossible. I, I lost three fights. I, I had every possible accident injury that could happen did. I, I had zero luck that in that 2014 year from breaking my ankle. I broke I my remember toe. That fight. I, oh, that fight was yeah. rough, man. Jeez. I, my able to fight. Um, it was so cold in the back. I was walking out and I had to walk up some steps and I fucking poor part of my language, but no, man. I pulled up I pulled a muscle walking out to the cage because, like I said, it was super cold, mm-hmm. and um, I had to. I had to. Go, I, I was just walking up these stairs, and next thing I know, I felt like some, like shot, like someone shot me in the back of my leg, my right, my right leg, and like I just, like I said, just like anything that could happen. If there was a banana peel, <laughs> I found a way to step on it. So, um, you know, I, I think trying to juggle both of those and trying to fight, you know, ultimately is what led to my early retirement as well as all the concussions. But um, I owned a gym for about two years. I ended up selling it about a year after I retired, made some money, and I actually dropped out of college my senior year. And um, so I took the money that I had that I made um, from selling my gym, and I used that to go back to college and finish my degree. That's so awesome. went back cool, finished my business degree. Um, I started off with accounting originally, and then at 31 years old, when I decided to go back and finish, I forgot a lot of my math, so I ended up finishing with a business marketing degree, just so I could finish and get it done, but um, um, I actually am in medical sales now, and I work for a great company, Bayer, B-A-Y-E-R, um, you know, they make a leave and stuff like that, they actually have a, a radiology division, so I actually work in Bayer's radiology division, uh, selling contrast and injectors, um, software, as well as pharmaceuticals as well. So um, pretty, it's pretty cool, man. Like my transition from fighting to going back to college and being a student at 31 years old. And hey, I went man. on campus with all the 20 year olds. It was crazy. <laughs> well, they're probably like, I'm not going to mess with that guy. That guy can kick my ass, you know? <laughs> None of them knew who I was. Really? But there was a couple, couple of the nerds. Uh, a couple nerds in there, like, and there were just kids like, like that just Googled me. Like, really? they, they, they saw my name, like, because we had, like, like had to write our names on, like, name cards and put them on our desk. It was so funny. So, like, some people Googled me, and they're like, we know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. They're, like, little kids. But um, I still have friends that are, like, 23, 24, 25 years old that um, I graduated with that are, like, asking me for, like, life advice and how to get jobs and stuff. It's and uh, like we graduated at the same time, but I, I made friends while I was there, which was pretty cool. That, that, that's cool, man. And that, that's awesome. Especially um, it's always interesting just to, to listen to especially fighters and what they do next because um, they usually define their whole persona as, you know, a f- cage fighter. So then once they leave, they stop that profession. It's kind of hard to kind of separate that. But it, I'm glad that you found your way, man, and, and that you're happy. You know, I think, um, not to say that I was any smarter than anybody else, but when I, like, I'm I'm 35 years old. I started fighting. I had my very first cage fight when I was a senior in high school. (laughs) I had my very first professional cage fight um, in August before my freshman year of college. Like, I, 
I started back in 2003 and I was in the UFC by 2006, August, 2006. So essentially three years after I started my professional career, I was in the UFC. And back then I fought Hermes Frank and I think he's ranked like fourth or fifth in the world at the time. I took that fight on like two or three weeks notice. Um, and I got $3,000 to show and $3,000 to win to fight a guy that was in the top five in the world. Really? That's it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like... So I, I always knew that I was, oh, I always knew that I was probably going to have to have a job after fighting. Like that was something that I always had in the back of my mind. Um, after I won my world title in 2008 in the WEC, um, a bunch of professional uh, football players, they do their off season and do a lot of training in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I had the privilege of training Jared Allen okay. uh, from the Kansas City Chiefs, Minnesota Vikings. I think he finished up his career at the Chicago Bears. And another guy named Boomer Grigsby, who um, he played for Miami. He played for the Kansas City Chiefs. He was a fullback. But they, um, I trained both of them. And when Boomer was out of the league, he started doing medical sales for Stryker. Okay. And uh, they're a big, like, ortho medical device company, top five in the world, I think. And, um, he, he told me, I remember when I was training him one day that he's like, he was making as much money doing that as he was when he was playing in the NFL. I mean, he was a league minimum guy, but still that's still like four or $500,000 yeah. a year. So I knew that I wanted to get into medical sales when I was 22, 23 years old. And as a world champion fighter, like I knew that that was something I wanted to get into after fighting if I wasn't like a millionaire fighter. But yeah, I think even even if I was a millionaire fighter, I would always, I need to be busy, dude. Like yeah. whether it's coaching or in a gym or something, like I would have to be busy. I'd always have to work or do something. Definitely, man. I uh, completely understand with that. And, and again, like I said, I, I'm really happy that, you know, you still continue that and you're happy um, with that, with your career. I mean, I, I, as a as a as a spectator, I love watching you because there was never a boring uh, Jamie Barner fight. I mean, it is always you had this mentality, man. Like you're swinging for the ropes. It's either you get knocked out or you're knocking the guy out. And a lot of people um, nowadays don't take that that approach uh, for the for the most part. I mean, as you can tell, like the the fight you saw the fights uh, this Saturday. With Usman. Um, I actually, I didn't. Um, <laughs> I, I told you I had all the kids over, right? I had all my nieces and nephews over. So I didn't. But um, uh, I usually watch this stuff after the fact. I usually keep up. I keep track with a lot of the fights. And I just haven't had a chance to watch them. But everything I've read, I've read up on them. And it, from what I was told, like, the the biggest the biggest upset, or Max Holloway, I heard he got screwed. Yep. Um, from every person that I trust in MMA, they said he won that fight, so I'm going to go ahead and go with him because, again, I trust him. Rose Namahunas, I know that uh, from what I was told, again, from people I trust, she won that fight. And then, um, you know, Usman did what he had to do. Like, if, yep. I, if I was Usman and I was going to, like, um, Jorge's only shot is to knock him out. Yep. So you smother him. You know, you, you, don't fight a, you don't fight a shark in the water. You exactly. drag that motherfucker up onto the beach, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I was pretty confident. Like, I wanted Masvidal to win. I wanted Rose to win. I wanted Max Holloway to win. You know, I wanted those people to win. But um, my money, my money was on Max actually. But I had my, I also had, I my heart was with Rose. My mm -hmm. money was on Rose, but my heart was with Masvidal. But my money was on Usman. Yeah, I mean, I, again, it, he played. A lot of people don't like his style. That's almost it's very similar to Tyson Woodley. You know, he's a wrestler. He takes you down, wears you down. Um, but again, it, it's not, I, I don't see a problem with that because again, a lot of people wouldn't pay just to see that fight just because they say it's a boring fight, but again, it's a smart fight. It's, it's what he knows best, you know? And at the end of the day, it's, it's, um, that's what it comes down to. I mean, yes, yeah, it's not the prettiest style to watch, but I mean, it gets it done. Yeah. And you know, Alex, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you, dude, there's a, I think my, my fight career is like I'm like 22 or 21 and 11 three and one there's probably six or seven fights out of those 11 losses that I could have won had I played it safe yep the I mean the the Abel Trujillo fight yeah I remember the game that plan was to take him down and smash him and I took him down and I smashed him pretty good I almost had him choked out in the end of that first round and but before 
I was walking out to the cage right after I pulled the muscle in my calf, Joe Silva comes up to me. He's like, all these fights have sucked. They've all been decisions. They're terrible. Um, all the bonuses are up every single bonus. And I'm like, all right, I'll go ahead and change that for you. I, I said that to him. I'm like, he's like, all these fights have sucked. You know, there's been no action. I'm like, all right, I'll go out there and change that. And I flip, I changed the game plan. Second, I'm like, all right, I'm throwing down. I thought, I thought I had a more out with the, with the wrestling. And I always knew, I knew I could go back to it. Mm-hmm. And then when I, when I started teeing off on him in that second round, I thought he was hurt, but he wasn't hurt bad enough. He put me down, but uh, yeah, man, there's like, there's at least six or seven fights. I think in my career that had I played it safe, used my wrestling and tried training, like, and tried going for just, to win the fight and Instead decision just, as opposed yeah. to the finish. I always work towards the finish, dude. Like, I, I don't know. I think it's like a wrestler mindset, but it's more of a, I think it's a less, I, I'm very impatient as a man. And I've always been impatient ever since I was a kid, just been very impatient. So I want to finish the fight right away. And I think a lot of it comes from maybe a lack of maturity, a lack of patience. <laughs> um, I always just wanted to finish the fight. I always just want to finish. So it didn't matter if it was five minutes, if it was four minutes and 55 seconds of the fourth round, I was always trying to finish you because I wanted that fight to end. Okay. And um, I got caught trying to finish fights, man. My mm-hmm. Shane Roller fight, I clipped him. I came running at him with some, with some haymakers. I I ended up you. slipping. I slipped on the mat, literally slipped trying to finish him. And he took yeah. my back and choked me. Like, again, if there was a banana peel, I always <laughs> found a way to step on it. Well, except I, I, for against um ex- except for against Edson Barbosa. I didn't slip on a banana peel that night. <laughs> well again, uh I, I respect you as a, a person, I respect you as a fighter. I mean all your fights were entertaining and that's what um again, that's what people remember, man. Regardless of the, the wins yeah. or the losses and stuff, it, it's not about that. It's just about you um, you know, giving yourself to the sport. And I mean, you, I mean, you did, man. I mean, you started off, you started off at UFC, but let's go, you know, before that, right. In high school, it was what you went to Deer Valley, right. You went to Deer Valley. You were a two-time regional champion and state runner up. I didn't even know that your background was so, you were so heavy into wrestling. So have, imagine, you know, wrestling is like the kind of like the, the biggest, like, you know, platform almost, because then you can basically judge where the fight goes. You know, if the guy's teeing off on you, you just take him down. If you want to, you just take him down, pound his face. I mean, there's, there's a lot wrestling. I think is the, the main key and stuff. So after wrestling and after you did all that, you went again, you started UFC, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I went, I did like local promotions, mm-hmm. right. I had to fight regionally. Um, I fought locally, then I fought regionally. Um, I went out to Louisiana. I went to Canada twice. Um, I had some fights get pulled out, um, get pulled from me in New Jersey. I had a fight in California. I had two guys, like, after weigh-ins, bail. Like, they showed up to the weigh-ins, they do the weigh-ins, and then they didn't show up to the fight. That happened to me twice. And after that happened two times in a row, Mm -hmm. that's when I got the call to UFC. Um, So, yeah, it was – yeah, I started my very first professional fight was March of 2003. I was a senior in high school. It was like right before spring break. Okay. And then I think I fought three times as an amateur. I was like two and one as an amateur. Then I went pro because back then the rules were the same. Mm-hmm. The only difference is you you got paid. <laughs> and yeah. uh, my very first pro fight, I made $100. And for me, I'm like, oh, man, that's like three 30 packs. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to fight this guy for $100? I would have fought him for free. But all right, three uh-huh. 30 packs, let's do this. Oh, so, man. yeah, that was it, man. Mm-hmm. And then you went to um, – after you, I think you fought uh, two people in UFC, then you went to WEC, right? WC, you yeah. had some good success. Can you tell me a little bit more about WC and – and the difference between UFC and WEC, and if you liked it a little bit more. Again, Chris Lytle was talking about it on my show, and he was saying that obviously it was more focused on the like, you know, lightweights and featherweights and strong weights more than UFC had at the time was heavyweights and light heavyweights. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, um, I was 21 years old um, when I first signed with the UFC. I got my first win um, in 2007. Um, against Jason Gilliam at UFC 68. And then that's when they, right when they acquired WFA, WEC, 
and um, they, they, it may have been even when they were, when they acquired pride, but anyways, they, they acquired like a bunch of different companies and they just, mm -hmm. they acquired them uh, just for their contracts. Okay. And so they ended up doing away with WFA and pride or whatever. And they kept the WEC and yes, they centered it around lightweights. And what they did for me was like, we're trying to build up this organization. We're going to send some of our younger talent down there. Um, they gave me a $5,000 like bonus to go down to the WEC and they increased my pay by 4,000. So it said 3,000 to show 3,000 to win. They bumped me up to 7,000 to show 7,000 to win. And they guaranteed that all my fights would be on TV. So back then it was Comcast, went to 80 million homes. It was on the Versus channel yep. and they had the exclusive contract with uh, PBR with the, yeah, the pull, yeah, the pro bull riding and all sorts of stuff. So, um, it was just a good opportunity. Um, good opportunity for me to grow. I really liked the WEC. It was a very small community. Yep. So I was friends with most of the fighters because we saw each other all the time. I mean, I was doing guest appearances and most, if I wasn't fighting, mm -hmm. I was usually, they usually flew me out to a lot of the, to the fights to like promote them or do like to do the Q and A's at the weigh-ins. And I liked it, man. It was, it was a fun time. I enjoyed Uriah and all of his guys going out to Sacramento. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed all the people in the organization because it was just really, um, it was fun. Like it, it was small. It was like being a part of a real exclusive community. Um, but it still had the same politics as the UFC. There was no negotiating contracts. Mm -hmm. um, they Uriah was a golden boy, so he got all the big corporate deals. And then they had the big um, Mexican push for Bud Light. I don't know if you remember that, but Efren Escudero, Miguel Torres. Miguel Torres, I remember, the, yep. Yeah, a lot of the Hispanic fighters, um, they, got, they got Bud Light money. They got and, – and there was Bud Light and No Fear were the big corporate sponsors, and they gave – I raced motocross. I did all sorts of crazy shit. Like before Donald Cerrone was Donald Cerrone doing all the crazy shit. Mm -hmm. I was out jumping my dirt bike, doing races, do, doing all sorts of stuff. So I thought like I would be a perfect fit for No Fear. And I was a world champion and Uriah yeah. lost his belt to um, Mike Brown. So I thought for sure that I was going to get one of these deals. And they they had they picked their favorites and when mm. when Uriah got that deal and they and he kept that deal and it ended up turning into the Amp deal, um, like he got so much exposure because he got he was in like seventy five thousand seven elevens. Oh really? Yeah. With, with, with no yeah man, so he got a lot of exposure and then when Anthony Pettis came out they um and did his super kick like I, he got Amp, but I think he was also a part of. Uh, he may have been on Uriah's like management team too. Cause they got, they got the amp deal as well. So there was just like a lot of like politics and stuff, dude. And for me, I was super emotional back then. And I always felt like I wasn't good enough. So like, I always took things personally if I didn't get shit. Yeah. And uh, so I really hated the business side of fighting. I loved the training. I love the competition, but everything that Mark Hunt told you is fucking true. Mm -hmm. They're scumbags. <laughs> they are not good people unless you're like one of their golden boys. But how if you ever complain or speak out against them, you get shunned. Yep. And um, you know, I'm one of those guys that got shunned from them for sure. Yeah, he, he was saying I think I think he was uh lasted in the UFC for around like five five to six years and he no, I think it was seven years or something like that. And he's told me six of the years that he was in the UFC, he was like, I was unhappy. He's like, I'm happy now and I was I just, I felt bad for him, you know, and again, he was telling me that, you know, Tim Sylvia is, you know, I think he's doing a GoFundMe page because the UFC doesn't pay for some of his injuries, especially the injuries. I think it was from the Frank Mir, if you remember that, it was a long time ago. Yeah, with the arm bar. Yep. Yeah. And um, he's still trying to, I guess, pay for those surgeries or something. So, yeah, Mark, Mark, Mark had a lot to say. And again, um, it, it's, People don't see that, I guess, you know, through here. They see, you know, pay-per-views. They see the UFC. They see this. They see everything. But, you know, you, you really don't know what happens behind closed doors and stuff, man. It's uh, Again, it is a business. Dude, so it's a I was rough. a world champion. I was a world champion. I, named, I never, ever made more than $40,000 in a fight. Wow. I was a world champion. At one point in time, dude, I was ranked in the top three in the whole world, whether it was pride, 
um, K1. Um, what was the other one that they had where um, Eddie Alvarez was over there? Oh, Ryzen. Like, I mean, right. uh-huh. again, I was in the top five in the whole world, dude. I never made, never in my career did I make more than $40,000 in a fight for a fight purse. I've, I made money on bonuses because that's how I had to fight. I had to go out there and throw down like a motherfucker. Mm-hmm. So that way I could almost guarantee that I was going to get a bonus. Cause so, that's how I made my money. So you, you I made more money losing fight. than I ever did winning. So did you, so do you think your, your, that changed your fighting style just because you needed more money and stuff like that? Just cause you saw like, no, hey. no. Cause I'm a finisher. Okay. Cause I told you I was, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, I don't want to pin this on the UFC. Like they're assholes in their own right. But <laughs> my losses were because of me. Mm-hmm. I'm in pain. I was impatient. I was immature. I wanted to finish the fights instead of being patient instead of showing, you know, I guess a little bit more maturity. Um, you know, I went, I went in trying to kill. I tried taking heads off and again, it, like, like you said, it made me super excited. Like there was never, you're never like, Jamie Varner's fight, and I'm gonna go ahead and fucking go fill yeah. my drink now. Like, you're like, holy fuck, this this could go down. Like, anything yeah. could happen with this guy. So, um, I did like that, and I do. I still get a lot of respect from people. Like, a lot of people still like that fact about me. I still get some haters here and there, but I would say more than anything, I get I get a lot of support for my style and what I brought to the table. Um, you know, during, during my, uh, my UFC and WEC tenure. Definitely, man. Again, um, um, people that are who, who hate they're they don't know shit. I mean, we, we loved it again. Um, talking about WEC, I know that you said, you know, you were a champion. How, how was that feeling? How talking, go through that fight. Cause that's one thing I haven't talked to someone is, you know, winning, uh, you know, a world title, you know, how that feels, you know, what kind of emotions were going through you? If you remember the fight at all? Because some people do, some people don't. Some people are, it's almost like being drunk. You remember like bits and pieces of, of, of the moments. So if you can explain a little bit. Yeah, um, that's actually, it's a good question. And um, there's a little bit of a backstory. So go ahead. Um, you, me- you mentioned it earlier. Like I was a two-time region champ, mm-hmm. but I was a state runner-up. Yep. And then I went to junior college and I was a national runner up. And then I went to a division one university and I actually never competed at nationals because I dropped out before my senior, I redshirted my junior year. Then what would have been my redshirt senior year is when I started fighting in the UFC. So I actually had two more years of eligibility left in college. that I was going to compete. Um, so I was always kind of the bridesmaid and never the bride. Mm-hmm. Um, when I competed in college, I was my, the college I went to, the university I went to, Lock Haven University of Pennsylvania, they're Division One for wrestling, but they also had a boxing team. So I was able to do both sports. Wrestling practice was from 3.30 to 5.30, and boxing was from 5.30 to 7.30. So I was doing two-a-days, three-a-days okay. sometimes, because we'd have morning workouts for wrestling. And then I would also meet up with uh, one of my boxing teammates or whatever and do hand pads and stuff like that on my own. So I was working out a lot in college, three, four times a day, depending on the day. And um, so I did both and I ended up winning a national title in boxing. Um, it were, there was, there's like 65 universities in the country that mm-hmm. have boxing West Point, Annapolis Naval Academy. I think Iowa state, Cal Berkeley, um, Lock Haven, uh, Gettysburg. Uh, there's a bunch of, there's, again, there's a bunch of schools. Mm-hmm. UNLV has a boxing team, um, former pro boxer, uh, Skipper Kelp was actually the head coach oh. over there. So anyways, um, I won a national title, but when I got into fighting, um, I still kind of had that, like, I didn't look at boxing the same way as I looked at wrestling and, and MMA. Cause those were like my main sports. Boxing was something I did for fun. Gotcha. I was, I was athletic. I had had some boxing experience when I was a little bit younger, but I was just, I was able to get it. Like I, I picked up boxing pretty easily. I wasn't a very rigid, like most wrestlers are super rigid. Must, yeah. I was always very fluid. Um, I, I've just always been kind of a well-rounded athlete playing baseball. I swam, um, soccer. Yeah, I mean, uh, even your stance and stuff, you can tell, like, you, you can tell when a, a wrestler is, is you know, standing up trying to box. Like, you can tell they just yeah. look awkward, you know? Yeah, I, I had more I, – I was again, I was a little bit more fluid. So, when when going into that fight, you know, I had a lot of fears because, again, of constantly taking second. I, I In my mind, it's like I can never win the big one. I can never 
Like, like kind of like with, with Donald Cerrone, right? Every time he gets into a big fight, he loses. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee it that's in his head in some way. Yeah. And um, it was the same. And I had the same thing. Like every time I got into like a big match, I like, I would lose. And so I had a lot of fear going into that. And the game plan was to take him down. It was your typical wrestler versus striker combo. Yeah. But Razor Rob McCullough, like, he was tough, man. And he, dude, he had a great game plan. He was really, really hard to keep down. Mm -hmm. Really hard to keep down. Um, he had, before, I'd never seen a thing called the wall walk. And so when I would take him down, he would he push would himself that. up yeah. against the cage and use the cage to get up. Dude, no one really did that shit before. Mm -hmm. Like, no one ever seen it. So... I took him down a bunch of times in the first round. It was five minutes. It. <laughs> yeah, 5,500 feet above sea level, too. So Albuquerque's, again, 5,500 feet above sea level. When And Arizona is, um, shoot, Arizona is like 1,000 feet, 1,500. Mm -hmm. So, like, there was, like, the air was said. So after the first period, I was gassed. Yes. And I go up, I go to my corner. I, I on my hands, my, my arms are on my knees. I put my head down. And my cornerman, Trevor Lally, comes up, and he's like, hey, you're okay. He puts ice on my back. And he's like, dude, we're going to have to box him. Calm, calm as a cucumber. We're just going to have to box him. He put his forehead under my forehead. He's like, you're okay. We're just going to have to box him. You're going to have to trust your hands. You're going to have to box him. We can't keep this pace up. And I was forced to stand up during that fight. And so – the second and third round, it was almost like an out-of-body experience. It felt like I was playing a video game. So I do remember certain exchanges and certain feelings and certain thoughts from the fight. But I just started I, – I just got into a rhythm, man. It felt just like sparring mm -hmm. in the rhythm. And he didn't put a ton of pressure on me. So the I, it, the pace I was able to go, dude, was I could have went that pace for fucking 20 yeah. rounds. We had a good I, – I was – he was a very traditional Muay Thai boxer, and he again he wasn't a pressure fighter, so we just had a good rhythm going. And I just remember hitting him with some shots and moving, and I don't think he expected me to have the striking that I did. Mm -hmm. And you know, be, between that and then the fear of the takedown, um, I was able to put a cross hook cross combo together, and that's ultimately what lit him up, man. Mm -hmm. Like he wasn't he wasn't ready for punches and bunches. I think he was just looking for overhand right to a double leg and not thinking about you know putting you know me putting combinations mm -hmm. together so yeah man it was surreal and to to win that fight was probably the best it was the best feeling I've ever had because it was um all those doubts and insecurities that I had about myself that I wasn't I wasn't good enough um that I was always going to be the bridesmaid that I was I would never be cut out to be a champion or whatever all that bullshit, evil poison I told myself, it went away, man. In like a second. I was, I was finally good enough. Yeah. Finally, finally good enough. Again, that that's that's pretty cool, and it's a it's a story a lot of people don't hear about, you know, especially you know, the emotions, because you can't see the. I mean, obviously after when the fighters are done, and especially the interview part, man, it's like uh, weight's been lifted, man. I mean, it's just it just it drains you, and and it, I'm I was. Oh man, I remember watching that fight. I watched it, you know, a couple of days ago. It's it's still one of my favorites. Uh, one of the other favorites of of mine of yours was uh, Donald Cerrone. Obviously, both of them. I mean, those matches were, man. You guys threw everything at at each other. That that's again one of those oh. that those wars. Like no no one realizes like the day after. Can you explain everyone what the day after a fight is? Because I mean, if someone's not a fighter, they don't like, they don't realize all that shit and all the soreness and all that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, like, yeah. <laughs> the, the first fight was worse than the second fight. Yeah, um, I, I was able to walk out of that first fight, essentially unscathed as far as injuries are concerned. Um, so the very first fight, I broke my right hand in the first round of that fight. Yeah. I missed, I, I either hit him on the head or I missed the head and I hit the mat. I snapped my, I had a compound fracture on my right index metacarpal. I think in the third or fourth round, I kicked him in the face with my left hand or with my left foot and I broke my foot going into that fifth round. I had a broken hand where the bone was sticking out. I had a broken foot, um, but I was ready to win. I'm like, I'll jab him. I'll take him down, whatever it takes. I got this. Um, 
we got into an exchange and I was on the ground and he, he need me in the face. I remember. And, you know, like, I loved how he was able to spin that to where it was like me quitting, but he knows the rules. Yeah. He knows the fucking rules. He knew the rules. He knew I was on the ground. So he was able to spin. I think he was looking for a way out. Mm-hmm. I think Donald, he would, he had lost every single round of that fight. He got dominated in the first, got dominated in the second, got dominated in the third, and he got kicked in the face in the fourth. He didn't win any rounds. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. I, I felt like he was looking for a way out. If he wasn't, a professional kickboxer need me in the face. Even a glancing blow. Mm-hmm. I had a lesion on my, on my right retina. Um, I was light sensitive, couldn't see out of it for like three days. I was light sensitive for like two weeks. Um, you know, like that was, that's probably like the one thing about my career. That's like the one stain on my career that really kind of bugs me is that that moment, that fight and how the fans kind of turned on me. Um, Cause I wasn't able to defend myself. I wasn't able to fight again for almost a year, dude. I had to have two reconstructive surgeries on my hand. <laughs> like, wow. like I was, I was, I was out for a year. I couldn't, I couldn't train for six months because I had these pins coming out of my hand. Dude, it was, it was wild. It was, it was a wild time. Um, but the, the feeling after that fight was, I, I felt like I'd been in a car accident, man. I wasn't normal for, man, I, I was, my, my pee was like dark brown, mm. like dark, dark brown mm. after that fight. Like my, my next, like, probably three or four Ps were, like, dark brown. Um, I was extremely sore. Uh, I think I just laid in bed for, you know, after, like, between doctor's appointments, all I did was lay in bed. Mm-hmm. Um, they gave me a bunch of Vicodins and shit, and I, I just, I never did drugs, never took pills. Mm-hmm. So I, I didn't take any, I didn't take any painkillers during that whole time. So I was just, like, laying in bed, just in pain, pretty miserable for about two weeks. Wow, man. That's... That's crazy. And again, um, um, that fight and the way uh, people go through, especially fighters. That, I mean, again, you had that warrior's mentality, man. I mean, you've, you, you suffered injuries during fights that I have known, and you just kept on. You know, the last one was the one in the UFC with your ankle. I mean, that was – that is that is gruesome. And I mean it in the best way possible. I mean, you – were standing on on your feet with a broken ankle and you were still throwing bombs like that that is like you understand that's that mentality man to have that to just say fuck it and just keep going is is unbelievable i mean again how sad is that that i was so much better than him that with one fucking foot i was still able to win that round he's i hate james krause he's such a bitch I wanted to fight him again. He's a fucking pussy. And he's like talking shit. Go get a win. Motherfucker, I was a world champion. I saw you get knocked out by Donald Cerrone. Yeah. You know, you got fucking lucky. My ankle fucking broke. Yeah. You know, it was from his kick. It was from his kick. So good. Good for you. That has like never fucking happened in MMA where someone kicked someone's ankle and broke it. Like yeah. it's never happened. Like he literally won the fucking lottery. And I wanted that fight again so bad. And all he did was talk shit. Ah, I hate that motherfucker. But yeah, that was a good fight. And that was like, I think that was, that was an opportunity for me to like show all the naysayers that said I quit and gave up in the Don Cerrone fight. Like, yeah. no, man. Like, the doctor stopped that fight. I wanted to keep fighting. When the motherfucker's like, how many fingers am I holding up? And I just guessed two and he had three. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah, I get you. And how, how many times did you – I'm trying to remember because I remember – I think you – how many times did you fall in that fight because of the, your ankle? It was like three times? It was like, Three or was, four, yeah. I don't know. I, I didn't count. I was just trying to beat his, beat his ass. I was trying to finish him, <laughs> so I didn't – I knew I was fucked. I knew I was fucked. So I if uh, if there was any any way possible of having a rematch, you coming out of retirement, would you, would you fight him? Yeah. <laughs> I would come out of retirement for it. I, I hate him. There's like there's like two guys. Okay. There's him, and then I have a former training partner named Estevan Payan, and I hate that motherfucker too. <laughs> um, he's a bully. He 
he beat up one of my am so he was a pro fighter fought in strike force all this shit mm -hmm. um there was a we had an amateur guy that was like oh and one and he sparred with this amateur and broke the kid's orbital and his nose in one sparring session like wow. just completely teed off on a guy that yeah what kind of sparring is business. that man that's... Dude, he's just a – he's a terrible, terrible human. So there's, like, two people I would come out of retirement for, and those are the two. Gotcha. <laughs> but most likely it will – I mean, never happen. But if there was a lot of money on the line <laughs> and those fights are a really awesome charity, I would I would consider it for sure. All right, man. Again, um, you, uh, you've you always been a, a, a fan favorite in my eyes. I, I always watched – I loved watching you in the WEC. I loved watching you in your UFC, man. Um, you did great things. I loved your style. And it, the most important thing that kind of stuck with me with your style of fighting is that you gave it everything you had. You know, you, it wasn't like you were trying, to, like we talked about before, it wasn't like you were trying to just, you know, outbox the person just to, to win the round. Even if you're Grind winning the round, decision. you're, you're yeah. going, you know, haymakers all day. And you know what? I, I really respect that as um, – um, as you as a person and as a fighter, man. And, and I loved it. I loved everything about it, man. I do appreciate you, brother. Thank you, man. And, appreciate and, you. That was, that was awesome to hear, man. Thank you for that. No problem, man. And uh, again, thank you for coming on. Thank you for spending time. I know I, you probably want to get the hell out of your car and stuff and <laughs> go home. I know you got a couple of uh, chocolate labs, huh? I saw them on. Yeah. Twitter. I got a couple of puppies at home. I have a, uh, I saw some stuff on the honeydew list that needs to get completed today. No man, but definitely. Uh, we'll keep in, in contact again. Um, I'll I'll text you here and there. None, not to bother. Yeah, Alex. Whenever, man. I I'm not like on some crazy high horse. If you if you need to bullshit, need need some content. You want some? You want someone to you know share a piece of their mind? I got you, man. I can talk about a lot of shit. And uh, th thanks again again for showing up, and I do appreciate you. And again. The people that watch this, they appreciate you too, man. So thanks for everything, buddy. Perfect, man. I hope you have a great day.